Uh, I grew up an Army brat. My dad was a World War II and Korea vet. Uh, and uh, I spent the first, I guess, eight or nine years of my life traveling around the world. Uh, I spent time in Japan. Dad worked for uh, General MacArthur in his headquarters with the occupation forces. Um, spent time at some later date in living in France for two years, maybe almost three years and then a couple of different places in the United States. Uh, so, so I guess what that leads to is I, and maybe I had the, the army in my blood. I, I admired my dad tremendously. Like a lot of kids, I wanted to be just like him. Um, but I wanted to do one thing he hadn't done um, and, and to do it for him, and that was go to West Point. Uh, my dad had tried in the 30s to go to West Point and the, in those days, each army area had its own prep school. <clears throat> and the first year, and I'm not sure the sequence is proper, but the first year he, he flunked the math part of the end of the exam. The second year he passed math, flunked English. The third year he passed English, passed math, failed the physical because he was too light. So he went home, he, he told me he went home and he ate bananas and drank milkshakes for about three weeks and packed on some weight so he could go pass uh, physical. And he finally had realized his dream of, of being accepted, uh, probably as far as I can figure, maybe the class of 39 or the class of 40 at West Point. So he's home on leave, working out, getting ready for beast barracks. He gets a letter from the War Department that says, Dear Sergeant Headley, uh, because you will be six days over the age limit upon the entry date of your class to the United States Military Academy, your appointment is hereby revoked. It crushed him. He, he got out of the army, um, and and I can only imagine how dejected he was. I failed the first time I tried out of high school, um, and I know how that affected me. But I can't even imagine having an appointment and having it taken away from him. And, and so I wanted to go for him. Besides the fact I wanted to go, period. I mean, he didn't force me into that, but I wanted to go in a way to give him the experience through me. Uh, that first day of Beast Barracks as we marched down to the trophy point, um, being as tall as I am, I was in the right file. And of course, all the upperclassmen were screaming, don't gaze around, smack head, and all that kind of stuff, eyes to the front. But my mom and dad and sister were standing right on the curb. Uh, and when we passed by, <clears throat> I saw tears coming down my dad's face. All right, so that kind of made it worthwhile for me on a couple of levels. I had finally made it, and I could tell that he was more than happy that I'd made it. Um, I never wanted to do anything else growing up but go to West Point. I, 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 no other school ever attracted me. No other profession ever attracted me. I wanted to be a soldier. I wanted to be an infantry soldier, and I wanted to lead soldiers. Um, and uh, all through high school, uh, we, we, when my dad, my dad retired from the army in France, uh, we came home on the SS United States. Uh, we went to Carteret, New Jersey, where my mom's mom was living. I suspect dad got out on some emotional knee jerk reaction to something because unlike, unlike his normal modus operandi, he had no plans, I don't think, on what he was gonna do. And I remember my mom and dad having some interesting discussions about what the future was, where they were going to go, what they were going to do. The end result was that we wound up uh, living in Rochester, New York, uh, which had been my dad's hometown. And that's where he felt comfortable and that's when we went back. Um, and, and again, while my dad never pushed me in the direction of going to West Point or going to the Army, he, um, he encouraged me when I evidenced the interest uh, to the point where we would make, I guess in, in high school, we would make yearly trips down to West Point to go watch a parade and go to a football game. Uh, you know, one year I was within touching distance of President Eisenhower. Maybe it was a reunion year for him or something. Uh, and that solidified my desires. I mean, there's nothing more impressive than a full dress review on the plains of West Point, particularly for a high school kid, right? Um, so that was kind of my upbringing. 
like I say, I, I tried to get to West Point out of high school. I didn't make it. I think I was a fourth or fifth alternate or something. So my chances were non-existent. So the day after I graduated from high school, there was an OD staff car in my driveway uh, in Rochester to pick me up and drive me to the reception station in Buffalo, New York, whereupon I enlisted in the United States Army. You enlisted? I enlisted, yeah, at age 17. Wow. Um, I, spent my, I spent my 18th birthday in basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey, saying, what the heck am I doing here? Uh, but uh, I had heard that the Army ran a prep school. And in those days, it was at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. And I thought, you know, if I couldn't get high enough grades coming out of high school, maybe if I go to prep school with all the references on English and math, English and math, English and math, that's all we study. It's all we prep for. You know, maybe that will get this not too bright light uh, uh, qualified enough to go. Um, and, and so I had to take a test entrance exam for that place. I think I might have been in AIT at Fort Dix at that time. Um, and, and John, I, John, what what year are we talking about now? Uh, I graduated from high school in 1963. Okay. All right. So it was the year <clears throat> 63, 64. Okay. Uh, I, uh, one advantage to being at Fort Belvoir is that we were encouraged, and in those days, prep school was only for primarily regular army soldiers who wanted to go to West Point. It, it wasn't a, a, a poop school for recruited athletes like it is today or anything else. It was for soldiers out of the army who wanted to go to West Point and needed a little help getting there. Um, so we were, there were a certain number of appointments in every class available to regular or maybe a reserve army soldiers to go to West Point. Um, and so while we were there, we were encouraged to go down and see our congressman because if we could get a congressional appointment while we were there, that saved one slot for another soldier who couldn't get to a congressman or whatever to vie for the slot open to the army guys. Uh, so I, uh, I managed to get to DC. I met Representative Ostertag from Rochester area. I uh, had a talk with him. Blowing blizzard, one of the worst blizzards in DC history. Unbeknownst to me, I caught the last bus from Belvoir into DC. Uh, very proud of the fact I just been promoted to private E2 so I could put on my mosquito wings, right? I sewed those on myself so I could impress the representative when I went to, went to see him. Um, I walked into his, I found his office, walked into it. Everybody's getting bed built up, ready to leave. And, evacuate DC because of the blizzard. Um, his secretary announced my presence. He said, Hadley, how the hell did you get here? Get in here. And I walked into his office, had a nice discussion with him. The end result was that he offered me an appointment to West Point for the class of 1968. And that's how I got in. Wow. Well, I learned something new today. I didn't realize that, I, I thought the only path into West Point was out of high school. I thought if you enlisted and then wanted to pursue becoming an officer, your only path was OCS. I didn't realize you could be in the Army and go to West Point. Yeah, yeah. As a, like I said, the, the, the makeup of the cadet candidates, I think, has changed over the years. Mm. <clears throat> and it's now be, become a, a place where athlete, recruited athletes who may not meet the standards go. My understanding that, it, that that's the bulk of the, of the attendance at the school. Uh, but in my time, there were no recruited athletes. There were athletes there in whom West Point had interest, but they hadn't been recruited for anything mm -hmm. yet. And they hadn't been offered a, a, an appointment to West Point if you can qualify academically. Yeah. So it was all soldiers. I served with guys who came out of Korea, uh, served with, a, with a, so a guy who had been a, a guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Uh, served with a couple of guys who came out of the 82nd, um, just just a bunch of good soldiers together, all with the objective of trying to get to West Point. Wow, that's amazing. So you graduated West Point uh, spring of 68? Yes. Right, so this is this is after the siege at Quezon, this is after Tet. I mean, those things happened during your last semester at West uh, Point. Yeah, that, that's correct, yes. So... I mean, how much did that news inform uh, 
you know, your conversations at the Academy? Uh, uh, you know, when we entered in the spring of 64, probably nobody could find Vietnam on a map. It wasn't in the news in the early 60s to any great extent. Um, while we were there, we realized we were going to become a wartime class because that's where we were going to go. Uh, as the news came in, particularly after 65, uh, with the Iodrag Valley fight with the Seventh Cav, which was the first big fight with the NVA, um, we began to get more news. And then um, in, in the mess hall at West Point, there's a poop deck. And it's a high deck on which uh, the officer of the day sits, from which announcements are made, and that kind of thing to get the attention of the whole corps of cadets, right? And all of a sudden, we began to get announcements from the poop deck of funerals for returning graduates who were going to be buried in the West Point Cemetery. Oh, my. As time went on, um, when we started to get a couple of guys from 66 or 67 come back, <clears throat> in a lot of cases, we knew those guys or we knew their names because of what a position they might have had in the Corps. And so it became more of a reality to us. Yeah, um, it's not just a, it's not just news reports at that point, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when a guy from, from your company who graduated two years ahead of you that whom you knew comes back to be buried, that has an impact on you. And, and particularly when you're a young kid, basically, um, you know, uh, not being exposed to that kind of thing before directly. I mean, I'd heard stories from my dad and, and his buddies, but the, directly, all of a sudden, no, geez, I knew that guy and he got killed in Vietnam. It really had an impact on us. So as you started to realize, as you, as you said, that uh, you were going to be a wartime class, um, can you talk a little bit about how that felt and, and what was it like to discuss that with your father, who was a veteran of two wars? Um, <clears throat> I don't, you know, I, I, I might have had one or two discussions with him my last year or two. Uh, I didn't see him. We didn't get a lot of passes. You know, I got home for Christmas and in the summer, and that was it. Um, so at, at, at Christmas time, discussions were other than war-related discussions. During the summer on a 30-day leave, if I was home for that time period, maybe dad would ask me how I was doing and what were they teaching me militarily. Uh, I, it probably interested in what kind of prep was I getting with him figuring um, that I was probably going to wind up in Southeast Asia. Um, for those of us at school, uh, we talked about it a little bit more. Now, we didn't know a whole hell of a lot. I mean, you know, we had classroom instruction and tactical training and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but the, 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 going to see the elephant was an unknown for us. How, how is it going to be? Uh, we wondered about that. You know, like any young soldier who figures he'll go to war, you, you get the normal questions of, God, what's that going to be like, and how am I going to do, and all that kind of stuff. And 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 we talked a lot about what branch you go. You know, and there were some who were gung ho, wanted to go infantry. Uh, there were some who said, Jesus, I don't necessarily want to get my ass shot at, so maybe I'll go Signal Corps or something. Um, but you know, it it was something that we were all certainly well aware of, particularly our last year, our first year, um, when there was maybe a little bit more emphasis. And during that time, we were getting peas, professors, who we call peas. We were getting peas coming back who had combat experience in Vietnam. Yeah. Schwarzkopf, Schwarzkopf was one of my peas. And he spent a lot of time talking with us in class about his combat experience because he was trying, I think it was a physics pea, but he was trying in his own way to get us mentally prepared for what we were probably going to face and, and, and trying to let us know what it was like. Uh, I made a pretty good acquaintance of uh, an instructor in the military art department who was a gunship pilot, uh, flew Charlie Malahuis. Uh, and he was teaching military history, uh, which I loved. And I took all the 
electives possible in that. We became pretty well acquainted. I dated his niece for a while my last year there, um, got to know him fairly well. Uh, and he would talk to me about what it was like, John, you know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, let me tell you about this. Let me tell you about that. Uh, look out for this, look out for that. You know, so the, the, the instructor core was also getting involved in trying to get us ready to go. And of course, we we sucked that up. I mean, we'd much rather tell war, you know, hear war stories and solve physics problems. You know? uh, so, yeah. so I think a lot more interesting. So, John, without without skipping any, uh, without skipping over any salient uh, uh, details, uh, can you summarize for me the path between graduation and Vietnam? Sure. Um, and not wanting to get into a whole lot of detail, but mine was a rocky path. Um, I almost got booted out of West Point my, at the beginning of uh, sophomore year, year on year, because I was having problems with some of the requirements in the Office of Physical Education. Now, I'd never had a problem with basic training. I used to just about max the PT test and all that kind of stuff. You said, of sudden, a, you said you're a tall guy, right? Yeah. How tall I'm are tall you? Guy. Uh, six four. Six four. Yeah. Uh, didn't weigh then what I weigh now, but uh, probably in those days I probably weighed 180, 185 pounds maybe. Um, but all of a sudden I began having some problems that were that I that I, I couldn't understand. And at one point I passed a a, a rigid requirement on the indoor obstacle course, which was a killer. And, and I didn't make it through that. And I passed out. And as a result of that, I got turned out. In other words, I failed PE for that semester, but given the opportunity to take a re-exam to get myself reinstated with my class, right? And I, I happened to fail that test as well. Uh, so I was basically um, dismissed from the core cadets, although I still lived there. We had a place under the guard room called the Borders Ward uh, for folks who didn't measure up to the standards around the way at West Point to go. We didn't eat with our buddies anymore. We couldn't go to mess hall until everybody else had cleared out. We didn't go to class. We didn't do any of that. And part of that experience was a separation physical. So I went over to the West Point Hospital and I, and I saw um, a surgeon who a personification of a guardian angel as life forms, but his name was Thomas Gear, and he checked me out and said, "John, there is no reason in hell why you can't do these things which you're having problems with. There is just no reason. I can't see anything that's holding you back." Uh, and then I think he began to suspect something uh, of a birth defect in my rib area, so he said, "I'm going to send you to Walter Reed." We're not going to kick you out. Um, you're going to stay a, a, a fully enrolled cadet because this is not something that you failed because you can't do it. This is something you failed because your body can't do it. So I went to Walter Reed. Um, I spent, oh my God, probably a month or more there. I wanted, I had, I was kind of an experimental case for a, a bunch of thoracic surgeons. Um, I remember being taken into their conference room, you know, where they discuss unusual cases. And I was exhibit A one day <laughs> and all my exercise and stuff on anyway. So I went through some experimental surgery um, and recovered from it. Uh, one day the hospital commander who was a, a two-star came down to see me because it was unusual to have a West Point cadet in, in the surgical ward. And I was in the, of all places, I was in the Vietnam ward. Uh, so guys, used to, one guy used to come see me, been a helicopter pilot, had a hole through his forearm from a 51 caliber slug. Uh, my roommate had been an F-4 pilot, shot down in flames. His face was totally gone. They were rebuilding it. He had a blob of stuff for a nose with a couple of straws hanging out. And one day he had a pass. He said, John, look at this. I'm going to go meet my wife. And he pulled off the drawer and pulled out this beautiful case and opened it. And there were two ears in there that he stuck on the stubs on the side of his head. And this is what I'm seeing as a, as a sophomore at West Point. So anyway, I went back up to school. I had to stay in the hospital for a while. 
until those guys were satisfied that I was cured. Um, I never flunked a class. I had professors come over and help me. I had classmates come in and help put me up. I, I, I managed to keep my, my head above water. Uh, never flunked anything. And it was obvious at the end of that semester, at the end of my sophomore year, uh, that there was great improvement. Short story, I went through the same thing for a semester of my junior year. And then I spent my senior year proving to the Department of Physical, Physical Education that I was physically qualified to be an infantry officer and a commissioned officer. Um, they put me through things that only OPE at West Point can come up with. Um, I passed all of them, no problem. So I got my commission. I went to Fort Benning, like most infantry officers. Um, went to Ranger, went to ILBC, went to Ranger School. Ah, damn if I didn't have the same problems again. Um, to the point where I had to drop out. You can imagine what that's like when you're all pumped up to go to Ranger School and you can't make it. And the Army at that point was going to medically board me out. Um, and so I had a separation physical. So I went to Martin Army Hospital and who was the chief of surgery, but then Colonel Thomas Gear. And I walked into his office and he said, John, and I filled him in on what had happened, what my symptoms were. Um, I, I had problems doing chin-ups and push-ups and lifting my body up a rope or climbing a wall or whatever. My arms went numb. And he, so he said, okay, you got options. We, you are entitled to a medical retirement. And you could draw a, a pension. It'll be small, but you'll get some money for the rest of your life because this is not your fault. Um, or you can take a commission in quartermaster corps or something like that and not be a combat soldier. Or I can do more surgery on you because I got another idea. I said, do the surgery, sir. So I went in and had both arms operated on, both shoulders operated on in the space of, I don't know, a couple, three months, I suppose. Um, in the meantime, a board was convened to medically discharge me from the army. And I went to the board and uh, fought them tooth and nail, said, no way in hell are you booting me out. I'm going to make it and give me time. Uh, I refuse to go out. You just, you're stuck with me, guys. Uh, give me a chance. Let me see if I can do it before you decide to can my butt. Anyway. Did the, did the surgeon, did the surgeon back you up in front of that board? Oh, oh yeah, he certainly did. Yeah. yeah, he backed me up, told the board of my experience at West Point, and, and you know. So anyway, th his surgery was successful. Um, I regained the ability to do anything. By then, my my departure date for Vietnam, which had been preordained, was drawing close. I wasn't physically capable of going back to Ranger School at that time because I needed some convalescent leave and some time to get back in shape. Uh, so the Army and all its wisdom sent me, the Army uh, gave us six months of troop time before we departed for West Point. So I spent troop time as a platoon leader in the 29th Infantry, 197th Infantry Brigade of Fort Benning. Uh, so I could continue to go see doctors and do convalescent, you know, go to PT and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then departed and the Army decided that since I hadn't made it to Ranger School, they'd let me go to the Jungle Warfare School in Panama and route to Vietnam. Um, you know, very abbreviated course, but some of the same stuff that Rangers School covered. <clears throat> so I, I went there and uh, <clears throat> then on uh, my 24th birthday, I landed in Vietnam on the 9th of July, 1969. Um, really pissed because when I got there, no one had a cake for me, you know? No one had a... A what? Nobody had a nobody had a birthday cake for me. Oh, a cake. <laughs> yeah, I was used to getting a birthday cake, and there it was on my twenty fourth birthday, and nobody had a cake. Uh, but that was that was an intervening time between graduation and and uh, actually getting to Vietnam. Yeah, you know, and after all those years of French occupation, you know the cakes are good over there. Oh yeah, sure. If I could just get to a French bakery, I'd be. <laughs> it would have been good. Yeah. So what were your first impressions? Uh, where, where did you where did you come in and, and uh, what were your first impressions? Came in at, at Benoit and at the airfield there. Um, 
scared to death. Uh, you know, went to war with 200 of my best friends that I'd never met before, all by myself. Very lonely, lonely trip. Um, you get, you, you sink into your own thoughts and the normal questions that one asks oneself before one goes to war. Of, you know, am I going to be able to hack this? What am I going to do if I get shot? How's my, I was married at that point. What's my wife going to think if I come home with an, out, an arm or a leg or, and, and the biggest issue was, am I going to measure up? You know, I was a West Point grad. I was an infantry officer. And I figured there were certain um, levels of proficiency required from that. And I wondered if I, you know, if I was going to be able to hack it or not. The question of, you know, am, am, am I going to be a coward or not? I mean, that's just, that's a common thing. Uh, there was not a whole lot of uh, conversation on that airplane. Uh, I think every one of us, there were most of us were first timers. There were some returnees sitting by themselves up in the front of the airplane with brown bags and uh, and uh, interesting conversations. Probably uh, the rest of us sunk in our own thoughts. Uh, when we got close to landing, the pilot cautioned everybody. Said. You all be aware that this is going to be a quick landing. I'm going to spiral down very quickly and land. I would ask all of you to get off my airplane as quickly as you can because I need to load up with the returnees and I want to get out of here before we get shot at with mortars, rockets, or whatever, which happened periodically. Uh, and, and so that heightens our levels of anxiety. And when we crossed the coast and looked down, um, you know, you could see bomb craters and whatever. Just all that is there. So when I got off the airplane, the heat just would almost knocked you back in the airplane. Uh, the smells of burning shit and rotting vegetation and all that kind of stuff got to you. Um, and the fear factor, you know, holy mackerel, anybody would shoot at us. Um, they put us on buses to take us up to the replacement battalion. The buses all had screened windows, um, chicken wire type screening. Um, the bus driver was very proud to announce to us that, guys, that's not for your ventilation. That's to prevent hand grenades from coming through the window of this bus as we go up to 90th replacement battalion. Uh, okay. Of course, none of us had any weapons or, or anything. Uh, so I went, I wound up at the 90th replacement battalion. Uh, I had hopes of going to the 1st Cav Division because that was the newest and greatest thing going on in the Army with the air mobility and the helicopters and everything. Um, and, uh, you know, or maybe the 101st, we had heard about Hamburger Hill, which happened just shortly before we got there. Um, but when I, when my name, and all, all officers had to do was check a daily roster twice a day after breakfast and after lunch to see if our names were on it, which would then tell us that we were going somewhere. I think it took two days. Um, the rest of the time we laid around, uh, they had a little bit of the officers club there. We'd go over and drink 3.2 beer, um, sit around and try to wonder what was going on, uh, harass old guys if you saw them, what's it like, you know, geez, tell me and get shoved off into the side. Um, and one day, uh, my name was on the list, so I reported to the NCOs to report to and said, hey, Sarge, I'm going to go first calf. Here's my orders. Nope. Sorry, Lieutenant, you get over there in that group. Uh, sorry, I don't want to go the first calf. Uh, Lieutenant, you understand me? You get over there with that group. Third time, and his voice got a little bit stronger. And he said, Lieutenant, you're going to the 4th Infantry Division because they just had a big fight up at the boot plant. They lost a whole lot of platoon leaders, and that's where you're going. Okay. So uh, with a few other guys went down to the airfield, I don't remember whether it got on a C-123 or a C-130. I don't remember which it was. And we flew up to Playco Air Force Base, unloaded there, got off a bus and went to Campanari, which was in the base camp of the 4th ID. Uh, we reported into the replacement company in the 4th ID. Um, and we went through three or four days of training, uh, refreshers on weapons training, uh, requalifying on the M-16, a lot of combat medical uh, instruction, uh, some signal instruction, radio procedures, and that type of thing. All the basics that, that one needs uh, review of map reading, although they didn't take us on a map reading course outside the wire, thankfully. 
Um, and the, the, the full graduation exercises was a, a real life patrol on the Indian country. Uh, and of course they took us into an area that they knew was relatively safe, but we didn't know that. Um, so that was our experience. Uh, when that was done, I found that I was going to the 1st Battalion, 14th Infantry. Uh, they took me down to the battalion rear area where I met the S1. Um, I don't think I met the XO at that time. Uh, and the S1 briefed me and said, okay, Lieutenant Headley, uh, tomorrow uh, we've got a convoy going to Fire Base St. George, which is the home now of, of 114. Since you're the only officer, you'll be the convoy commander. And we're going about 23 clicks down the highway, Highway 14, I think it was, down to the fire base. Well, you can imagine my reaction to that, right? Okay. So the next morning came and I said, well, okay, you got to, this sounds hokey, but it, it, you, 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 you got you to gotta play the part. Mm -hmm. You can't let the soldiers know you're so scared you're peeing in your pants. Right. You, know? you, you can't do that. You've you got an image to uphold as an officer. Um, so I tried my best to do that. I never looked down to see if I was successful or not. Um, but I had a rucksack and my weapon and bandoliers, ammo and all that kind of stuff. And we finally got the word to hop on the trucks and get ready to go. So I grabbed my, my ruck and my steel pot and my weapon. And I got in the cab of the lead truck, deuce and a half, had a canvas top on it. Uh, right behind me was a young soldier with an M60 with the bipods and I'm sure he purposely put on my steel pot, uh, rest on my steel pot. Welcome to Vietnam, Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Then we're getting ready to cross the LD at the opposing time and the field first sergeant back there says, Lieutenant, Lieutenant. And I looked down and said, yeah, top. And he said, Lieutenant, you can't be no John Wayne without no bullets. Here's your ammunition which you left on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine the troops in the back and the other trucks had a good time with that. And uh, he handed me the two bandoliers of ammo I had neglected to pick up. Um, and uh, it was impossible for me to slink down much further than I could see. Right. <laughs> but uh, I had a radio handset from the guy behind me. And with LD time, we crossed the LD and away we went. Hmm. Uh, the ride down was. Uh, remarkable. We never got shot at, fortunately. Uh, but to see the see the Vietnam countryside and drive through it. This uh, is the central Central Highlands. Is that right? Central Highlands. In yeah. yeah. Can you do, can you describe that for people who may not have seen it? Oh yeah, sure. Um, dirt roads, uh, a lot of big holes in them. Uh, let's see. This was July, so I uh, I don't think it was monsoon season yet. Uh, dry, dust all over the place. Uh, the primary means of, of of transportation for the Vietnamese was uh, was a cart um, pulled by a water buffalo or the ubiquitous lambretta, uh, belching big clouds of gray smoke and and uh, all kinds of people piled on the back with animals or produce or whatever. Uh, there were no rules to the road. The bigger you were, the more privilege you had. Um, went past uh, uh, shacks, uh, residence houses that were totally built out of flattened beer cans. You know, so the whole whole wall was Budweiser beer cans that had been cut and flattened, and that was what they used to to uh, to build the side of their house. Saw several of those. Saw one Budweiser, and I saw one from PBR. Um, and, and I'm sure there were probably a couple others. Uh, the place was dirty. It smelled. Uh, kids running around in rags. Um, a lot of women carrying stuff on their heads and whatever. <clears throat> and a lot of guys doing nothing. Just sitting around smoking and, and uh, bullshitting and scowling at us as we drove by. Uh, not necessarily a welcoming environment. Uh, it probably took I don't remember. I'll take a guess and say an hour and a half to get down to the turnoff to go to Firebase St. George. Um, I mean, there were no power lines or anything. I mean, it was rural, third world country, um, Vietnam. Uh, I saw, saw some guys on crutches missing parts of their leg or whatever. 
I saw a couple of guys without arms, obviously war casualties. Um, but, uh, you know, it, the, the thing that struck me was the kids and the kids running alongside the, the trucks begging for cigarettes or, or begging for food. Uh, and the guy, you know, American soldiers are normally pretty generous when it comes to kids. And so guys throwing cans of sea rations down or the, the famous John Wayne candy bar that nobody wanted to eat and threw those down to the kids. Um, some of them wanted cigarettes and some of them were offering boom, boom, you take you take my mother, she is virgin, you know, no charge, you number one. Um, they're trying to do that for me. Um, so I, I, fortunately we got through that. I got a call from on the radio from the Battalion TAC, the Tactical Operations Center, uh, telling me that they had us in sight and that we sh I should expect to arrive at the wire of St. George within the next four or five minutes. So we turned off uh, the highway on a, onto an even more bumpy, rutted dirt road, went past the Bataan garbage dump, which smelled as you would expect an open garbage dump to smell like. Uh, and then all of a sudden, in front of me, I saw my new home. Uh, it was to be my home from July until the end of November, or maybe early December. Um, my first impression of that was holy cow. Uh, not an inviting place. Uh, the first thing I saw was three concentric rows of triple concertino wire, um, tangle foot barbed wire strung in between at various heights and so forth, and a bunch of bunkers. So uh, the, we pulled into a parking area in the fire base. I got out of the truck. There was a young soldier there. I don't know what his rank was. He wasn't wearing a shirt or anything. And he said, are you Lieutenant Headley? And I said, yes, I am. He said, please come with me. I'll take you to the company CP command post where you can meet your company commander. So dragging all my stuff. And this time I had my bullets with me. I didn't leave them behind. Um, I went up to meet my company commander, Captain Roger House, um, and went into his CP, which was a sandbag bunker. Uh, got a little briefing on the company and its organization and its strength and what it had been doing for operations. And he said, okay, I'm gonna call your platoon sergeant. Uh, he's gonna come up and get you and take you down to your, <clears throat> excuse me, your platoon CP on the bunker line. Uh, and you get to know your NCOs and we'll talk again. Okay. So my platoon sergeant came up, hell of a nice guy. I said, okay, Lieutenant, I'll take you down and I wanna introduce you to the squad leaders. Great. And here I'm thinking, okay, this is it. Uh, I'm going to take command of 30 some odd combat veterans as a brand new, very wet behind the ears lieutenant. Obviously, I mean, my jungle fatigues were brand new. My jungle boots were brand new. The camel cover on my steel pot was brand new. I mean, I was a quintessential newbie, like FNG. And I, mm -hmm. I can probably know what that is. Like you stepped out of a magazine. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and every orifice in my body puckered up because how 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 am I going to deal with this? You know? But I I went down uh, to my CP. I, had, I I met my RTO. I had three squad leader, four squad leaders there, three rifle squads, one um, weapon squad, sitting down just beginning to talk to him. And I had rehearsed, of course, and thought for hours about how, what's that, what are those first minutes, minutes going to be like? How am I going to approach this? How can I let these combat veterans know um, that I want to learn from them? Right? And then basically, I, that's what I started to tell them. Okay, I'm the new guy. Obvious. No bones about it. I admit it. I know it. I don't know shit. Um, you guys know it all. You've been there. Uh, you've been through it. Uh, I am the platoon leader, so this is my responsibility. Uh, I'm responsible for everything that happens in this platoon, good or bad. But I would hope that you guys will help train me. I'm not going to, I will ask for advice. Uh, I will ask, how, how do you do this? What's the best way to do that? Um, don't ever hesitate to come up one-on-one -on -one to me and, and, and give me some advice. Don't ever call me out in front of the soldiers because I won't stand for that but you're more than welcome one-on-one -on -one to come up and have a talk with me. 
Um, and it seems to be going okay. And all of a sudden my RTO comes out and taps me on the shoulder and says, Lieutenant, uh, CO is on the horn for you. Yeah, okay. Um, hey, John, settle your guys up. You're leaving. Say again, settle up. You're leaving. Okay, where am I going? And he said, well, you, we had a helipad outside the wire. He said, go out to the pad. You'll find, I think, three trucks, four trucks there. And you're going 14, 15 clicks further down the highway um, to a village that had been hit by the BC last night. And they need your help, and you're going to go down there and secure them. Yes, sir. <laughs> so uh, my call sign was Apache 6. The first platoon in Charlie Company, first battalion, 14th Infantry was Apache. Right? So I was Apache 6. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I, I can be like Geronimo, maybe, you know, fearless warrior. Um, and, I, and again, I'm, no bones about it, I was scared to death. Here I am going out on a mission. I've been in the, in the battalion maybe an hour and a half. I don't even know my squad leader's names by heart yet. And here I go. And that was my first day in the field in the first of the 14th. Hmm. Wow. So, uh, Were you were you with Echo Company at that point, or did no, that happen it was later? Char it was Charlie Company. Charlie Company. I spent I spent time as a rifle platoon leader before I went to the company. Gotcha. Had to have some experience, right? Sure, sure. Uh, well, what do you remember about the time that you spent with Charlie Company? Well, that that first day is one of my worst nightmares. I will tell you, because uh, we got down to the village and they had in fact been hit by the VC the night before because they'd evidently refused to pay their rice tribute or maybe a couple of guys had refused to go off with them and join them. I don't know what the reason was, um, but my first sight as we got off the trucks was um, the village chief's wife hanging by her feet with a baby that had been cut out of her stomach and was hanging by the umbilical cord. That was my introduction to the, the worst side of Vietnam. Uh, her husband, the village chief, and the village school teacher had been executed, and her bodies had been thrown down the well, which is the only source of potable water for that village. That, 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 that was my first day. Um, I mean, obviously, it still affects me. I, I will never. I will never lose that picture of that poor woman hanging there. And I, and I, I thought, oh my God, how can this be? You know, and, and I wanted to retch, but I swallowed it because I, again, I wasn't gonna show a sign of weakness in front of my combat hardened soldiers. I will tell you, my knees were trembling. My stomach was in, in an uproar and I was having problems comprehending what I was really looking at. Um, but then my training kicked in and I said, okay, Hadley, you got to secure this freaking village, man. Okay, let's go see how you do that. And so I, I had the then senior old guy from the village um, who spoke a little bit of English, not a whole lot, take me around the village, show me the perimeter of the village. Um, right outside of the village was a little triangular mud fort uh, that I was told had been built by the French. Uh, that had some barbed wire and concertina wire and stuff around it that I decided would become my CP and, and, and my facility. Um, and, and of course, the threats had been to the villagers, if you get Americans in here, we're gonna come back and see you tomorrow night. Okay, and that was passed on to me. I was fully expecting to, um, to be hit. Uh, so I formed a, a hasty perimeter on the outskirts of the village. Uh, some of the villagers had had some, you know, the regional force, popular force type guys, RFPF guys. They had a couple of M1 Garand, Garand carbines. Um, so I, I put them in as well. Um, I, uh, as night was coming, I was, my hands were shaking. I mean, I, I just, you know, I was scared. Um, 
but I went around and I did what I've been trained to do. Now I went around and checked each position. I checked, I had three machine guns. I, no, I'm sorry, I had two machine guns. I checked to make sure that they were laid in properly and they had interlocking fields of fire and the basics that had been drummed into my head in tactical training. Uh, I made sure that my guys were in at least two man positions all the way around uh, from one end to the other. Um, I left my rear open, figuring I would get warning from villagers screaming and hollering if the bad guys came through that way. I was on the primary avenue of approach into that village other than the highway. Um, and I, my thought was if I had to, I'd run like hell to get back into my little triangular fort with my guys. And so I did all that. And again, like I say, my training kicked in. Um, I got a combo check with my company CP, uh, made sure that I had good combo with them. Um, I pulled out my map and, and and plotted a couple of defensive fire registrations for the artillery battery on the fire base in case I needed them. Uh, I checked with my RTO to make sure that he had the right frequencies uh, for company CP, the battalion talk and the, and the artillery battery, the artillery LNO, all those things. Um, and, and I checked with my platoon sergeant and I said, okay, this is what I've done. Um, these are the concentrations I've plotted, what do you think? Okay. Looks good to me, look, you've done good, okay. And I had him with me when I went around and checked all the positions because mm -hmm. there are tricks of the trade that I didn't know yet. <clears throat> so I spent a sleepless night um, waiting at any time to to hear the sound of incoming and, and uh, being forced into react to that. Fortunately for me, nothing happened at night. Um, got up in the morning uh, to the sound of Roosters crowing. Uh, Vietnam in the morning is a wonderful place. It's not as hot. The humidity is not as bad. You get good smells from the vegetation. It's not that stamp from the dew, right? Mm. Uh, and and it's it's a beautiful country, and the scenery was pretty. And the villages, the huts were very picturesque. I mean, you know, if people hadn't been shooting at you. It'd been kind of a neat place. Um, and and so the villagers came down. They lived in in the huts on stilts. And they had a notch log ladder to get up and bring all their their their, their animals up at night and then pull that log up after them so the animals didn't escape or, or didn't fall prey to roving whatevers. Um, and and uh, pretty soon the fire started and you could smell stuff cooking and whatever. And I felt a phenomenal sense of relief. I had made it through my first night. Um, we we stayed there for um, 10 days, I think. Uh, we did a lot of training with the local guys. Uh, we were probed a couple of times at night. Uh, nothing really serious, uh, but, but there were bad guys out there and they did plink at us. Um, you want a funny story? Sure. I got a funny story. You know, there are, there are rites of passage for to be a real honest to goodness infantry combat soldier. There are, you know, and one of those rites of passage is the first time you went outside the perimeter to take a crap. Uh, that, that was not an easy thing to do, particularly if you're brand new and you're afraid of everything that's around you, right? So I, I had resisted as long as I could. I, had to I didn't even eat seeds for a couple of days because they will make you go do that. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to go, go do that. And finally, okay, I got to do it. So I grabbed my weapon, made sure I had a fresh magazine in it, slung a bandolier of ammo over my shoulder, grabbed my entrenching tool, the uh, bump wipe out of the sea rations, and and I went outside the perimeter and told the guys, I'm, I'm going to be off from the tree line there. I got to take a crap. Don't shoot me when I come back. Okay. So I went out. And, and it was like, you know, okay, I know they're out here somewhere. Um, and I found a tree that I could back up against and protect my back so that I wasn't exposed 360 degrees. I got myself ready. I was in a crouch position, right, with my back against the tree, with my weapon in, in my hand, scaling the tree tops. And I could just envision what could happen. And the, and the telegram that would go to my dad Dear Mr. Head or Major Headley, we are sorry to inform you 
that your son was recently killed in action while valiantly trying to pull up his pants and return fire to the bad guys or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I took what care of what I needed to. The sea ration toilet paper packs were really hard to open. And if you've got a weapon in one hand, you can't open, you know, so I reached out for some leaves, right? And took care of myself and I went back into the, into the perimeter. The next day I began to itch like mad. And I thought, what in the heck is going on? Poison, I didn't know if there was poison ivy in Vietnam or whatever. But oh my God, I was I, I was really in a lot of pain. And so I finally called my medical and said, hey, doc. I said, I, I don't know what's going on. I told him what I had done. I grabbed a bunch of leaves. I said, let's go in my CP. We'll run everybody out. You check me out. Okay? And and he did. And 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 he tried real hard to uh, to uh, stifle the chuckle. Uh, evidently, I I had uh, picked up a bunch of kind of sand flea like things with the vegetation I pulled up, and they had crawled up in and were infesting me and biting me, which was calling all causing all the itching. Uh, so he told me that he said you've got some bugs up your butt, Lieutenant, um, or no, he didn't call me. They all called me six. And he's got you bugs up your butt six. Uh, and I said, okay, well, how do we get them out of there? They're driving me crazy. Now, here's here's the, the soldiers playing with the newbie, right? Sir, the only way to get those out of there is to smoke them out. I said, what? It's humorous now. Uh, he said, yeah, we've got to smoke them out. I don't have anything else to get up in or to get them out with. I said, how in the hell are you going to do that? I said, we're going to start a fire out here with all kinds of green stuff, generate a lot of smoke. You're going to drop your drawers back up as close as you can to the fire, slap down, spread your cheeks, and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll direct the smoke into your body. <laughs> and this is the afternoon, right? Uh, so I, I got hold of my platoon, so I said, hey, look, do me a favor. Check the perimeter and tell all the guys to watch. Out, not to walk in because I, I, this is going to be embarrassing enough. Uh, so we did that, um, and of course some of the troops saw it, and, and it became it became one of their favorite stories about the new lieutenant. Uh, and strangely enough, it worked. Uh, I within a day or so, I was feeling a lot better. He had some salve to put on the bites and things like that, and and uh, that took care of my problem. But that's how I got through that rites of passage of going out to pick a crap for the first time outside the wire. <laughs> Man, it's not one thing. Yeah, you're right. If it's not one thing, it's another. Well, I do want to move on to uh, Echo Company. Uh, okay. But before we do that, is there anything else from your time with Charlie Company that you want to share that you think is important? Uh, yes, just one thing. Uh, and, and all this time... Uh, and I was uh, with them for three, four weeks, five weeks, I don't remember exactly. And all that time, I'd never met the battalion commander because uh, I'd been out with the guys most of the time. And the couple of days I was on the fire base, I never had cause to go meet them. So one day, and we'd been on a couple operations, company size operations, uh, company commander discovered that I really could read a map and I knew how to do land navigation um, and that I wasn't want to panic if something happened. I and mean, we got shot at a few times. And so we're going out on an operation where he was giving me half the company. He was giving me my platoon and the mortar platoon as infantry, not carrying their tubes. And he was going to take the other two platoons and we were going to go out and and uh, look for an NVA hospital. Right? So and we're this was a helicopter assault. So I'm on the pad with my guys getting ready to go and all of a sudden, up walks this very distinguished looking gentleman and his big hulking NCO. Lieutenant Headley. I looked over and he had rank on his steel pot and rank on his collar. Most of us didn't wear rank because we didn't want to be targets, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Victor Robertson, Jr. I'm the battalion commander of the 1st Battalion, 14th Infantry. This is Command Sergeant Major Wiggins. Names you never forget. Uh, we're going with you today. Oh my God! You know, here's God Almighty, as far as I'm concerned. 
going to go with me on an operation. And I said, yes, sir. Okay. I'm pleased to meet you. And he said, I want to tell you that we're going to be with you, but if we get into contact, I'm not going to tell you how to fight your fight. All I want you to do is tell me where you want me and my sergeant major on your firing line. We're going to be riflemen for you. I will not get involved in what you're doing. Yes, sir. So anyway, we got on the birds and went out and let us off, fortunately, a cold LZ. Um, and we went into the jungle. And for some reason, um, we were up a stream. Um, it was a, it was, a, you know, maybe 10, 12 feet wide, a little river, maybe 18 inches deep, moving pretty quickly, a lot of boulders on the side. And I, I think we had gotten some intel that this thing was maybe located near this river. <clears throat> so we were going up the stream. Um, I had my normal um, formation was I had a lead squad, then my CP, if possible, the other two squads kind of out on the flank behind me, and my platoon sergeant with a couple of guys pulled up the security. And in that environment, it, it was kind of difficult. I did have a squad on the other side of the stream, but the banks were so steep and the stuff was so thick, there's no way to put anybody up in there. So we kind of hugged the bank and hid under the trees as we were walking. And all of a sudden, you could hear the sound of a waterfall. And we went around in the, the stream, and there was an absolutely gorgeous waterfall. It was probably 20 feet high. And, and so, and, and it was hot, humid, triple canopy jungle. Um, guys were really getting tired. I decided, and we'd been at this for a couple hours by that point. Um, we had been shot, I forgot, we had been shot at once. I had a guy wounded. Um, I heard the cried that no commander wants to hear medic, medic, medic. I went running up. Um, the guy was wounded, not real seriously. We managed to get him out. The one thing that stuck with me from that is the smell of blood, kind of coppery smell of blood, because he, he had a lot on him. So anyway, we, we made it to the waterfall. We took a break, and I said, I can't stay down here. So I took a squad, and we scaled the cliff to go up and put security up on top of this high ground on the river in case anybody came down the, in that direction. Because we were, we were, we were fish in the barrel. Mm -hmm. We were, right? So I got them all in place, came on back down. It was, and it was an arduous climb up and down. It was almost vertical, pulling yourself up by ropes and rocks or whatever. And as I was coming down, I heard somebody screaming, six, six, come here, come here, come here. You gotta see this. And so I kind of told the guy, I said, what's up? And he said, look, we found a cave behind this waterfall. We haven't gotten in it yet, but there's a cave opening. So I got a couple of guys, the guys who discovered, we went into the cave. Lo and behold, it happened to be the hospital that we were looking for. Uh, it had operating rooms, it had wards, it had what looked like a classroom, it had a kitchen, uh, it had a dining room type thing. Uh, real incredible, extensive, um, uh, facility. There was relatively fresh bandages around, so we could tell it had been used in the not too distant past, and foot lockers and boxes with of stuff all over the place. So I said, okay, guys, let's grab that foot locker and drag it out. And it was kind of an arduous thing to pull it out of the opening of that cave and, and manhandle across this rock face underneath a waterfall to get out to the point where it was dry and we could get it down the rest of the way. Fortunately, the opening was only about probably eight feet up from the from the stream end. So we got it out, we opened it up, and on top was nothing but lacy black female underwear. Okay, so it was obviously a comfort station of some type, uh, or there, maybe there were nurses there or something. I don't know. And and sometimes mine works faster than reason. And I'm thinking, boy, this is the first time the tank commander has been out with me. And then all of a sudden, all hell breaks up up on top. I hear my machine gun going off. I hear my M79, the bloop going off. I hear AK-47s. I hear explosions. I go, holy jeez. So I grab my RTO and I scaled this friggin' 20-foot cliff. I'm gonna, I, 
I, all I, you know, I could, I remember, I, mean, I could hear the blood beating in my ears, right? And, and a sense of real urgency because my guys were getting shot at up there. Um, and I scaled up the top and then there was an NVA unit probably of squad size uh, that had come down the stream by the river, or uh, uh, trail by the river. My guys fortunately saw them first, but my first encounter with pulling a trigger um, at, at a known target, I saw a guy taking a beat on one of my guys and, uh, and I put him down. Um, <clears throat> contact lasted, was over pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, fortunately, none of my guys were hurt. Uh, my machine gunner was a big, huge strapping guy, was out in the middle of the stream, bare ass naked, firing his M60s because he'd been taking a bath. Mm. Uh, so I got hold of my squad leader and I reamed him a new one for the kind of lackadaisical lack of security up there. And then I went back on to, to brief the battalion commander on what had gone on because certainly he was interested. And I thought, well, when I go see him, I'm going to take him a present. So I grabbed a pair of pretty lace, lacy panties. And I went over and I briefed on what happened up there, no casualties, uh, everything was good. We did find the hospital, sir. It's back in there, it's extensive. You know, the smart guys need to come check that out because there's all kinds of stuff in there. And by the way, I have a memento for you so that you can remember the first time you ever went out with me in the field. And I presented him with these black panties. Um, he was a little nonplussed. He wasn't quite sure what to do with them. And he stuck them in his pocket, right? He said, <clears throat> Thank you, John. <laughs> and, he, and he walked away. Fast forward years later, um, 30 years later, 35, almost 40 years later, another long story. We, we re established contact with him down in Columbia, South Carolina. At that point, I was having yearly reunions of my recon. Um, and, and I and a couple of my guys went down first time to his house. Um, to meet him and, you know, welcome him back into the fold. And we were talking and getting reacquainted. And when he had left the battalion and changed the command, I'd put a red scarf around his neck uh, because he had really treated us incredibly well. Um, and he said, John, come with me. And he went back into his man cave and he opened the bottom drawer on his desk and he reached in the pocket and pulled out a pair of black panties and said, John, do you know where I got these from? I said, yes, sir, you got them from me. If you remember that first day on the river with dogs. Oh, yeah, I never wanted Lois to see these because I couldn't explain them. <laughs> so, so he kept them. Yeah, that's funny. So how did the transition from Charlie to Echo, oh, so yeah, from Charlie Company to Echo Company, <laughs> how did you learn about that? And and did you have, I mean, you, you, you must have heard of those guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. I mean, they were either famous or infamous. You can take your pick depending on what's going on. Um, and they, they always wore red scarves 24-7. You never saw one of those guys without a red scarf. Uh, and they had a reputation. Every time they went out, they got, they got in the contact with the bad guys. Every time, without fail. Even though that wasn't their mission, but that's what happened. And they were known as a rough, tough bunch of guys, right? They came back on the fire base one day. They, get, they captured a stray dog. They took an oil can, the old oil can with a long spout on it, right? They shoved it up the rear end of a dog, gave him a couple of squirts, and pointed him at the top. And this howling dog with his oil in him runs into the entrance of the top bunker and does circles inside. All the staff officers are the old school. Boiling out the, the entrance, nobody was hurt, but that was their idea of fun. Um, and their platoon sergeant was a big, huge, muscle-bound guy, like a bodybuilder. Um, and people were scared to death of him. Uh, he'd walk up the street and on the fire base to go to the chow hall. Everybody would get out of his way. He'd go get in line. Everybody in front of him would get out of his way so he could get in line. He'd get his food. And we had a we had a, a kind of a fly tent set up with a, some picnic table things. He had, and he'd go to find a place to sit. Everybody else at that table would get up and leave. They're scared to death. He looked bad. I mean, he looked like a bad guy. So that's what's my experience with Fox. One day I'm I'm, I'm walking past uh, the, the Colonel's hooch and he called my name. Yes, sir. He said, come on in here. Yes, sir. And he said, uh, he sat me down, talked a little bit. How do you like it here? 
<laughs> oh, it's fun, sir. I love it. Uh, what do you think of Padani? What do you think of your soldiers? You know, all those kinds of things. And then he said, are you a drinking man? And I said, yes, sir. I've been known to do that once in a while. So he reached down into his field desk. He pulled out a bottle of scotch and two glasses. And of course, he said, here you go. Thank you, sir. And we, we drank to the regiment. And he said, I got a request for you. Yes, sir. Um, I want you to take Fox Force and recon platoon. Um, now, to be a recon platoon leader is the primo assignment for an infantry officer, uh, first lieutenant type in the whole United States Army. I mean, those are that's a select group of guys. And he said, I, I, I want you to take Fox. And I talked for a few minutes. He said, how do you feel about that? And I said, well, sir, um, can I say no? He said, why would you want to say no? I said, well, sir, I don't know that I'm experienced enough to go take those guys out and do what they've been doing. I think I need a little bit more experience. I need to go get shot at a couple more times. So this, so this was maybe late November, early December? Uh, no, this is August. August? August uh, late August, maybe late August, uh, after I'd been in the battalion for six, five, six weeks, something like okay. that. Okay, okay. Um, and he, and he kind of looked at me and he said, well, okay. And so I walked out and, and I second guessed my decision, but I thought, Jesus, I, I don't know that I really am up to doing what those guys do. And I put them in harm's way if I go there and, and I step all over myself trying to do something that I shouldn't be doing. So probably a week later. You know, again, I'm not the brightest light bulb in the ceiling. I walk past the old man's suits again. Lieutenant Headley, yes, sir. Come on in here, yes, sir. And at that point, he had the bottle of scotch out in two glasses. He poured a little scotch, gave me one. We drank to the regiment. And he's, I'm sorry, my rings are hitting the table. I apologize. Mm. Uh, and he said, um, you remember the last time you were in here? Oh, yes, sir. You remember the request I had of you? Yes, sir. Okay, this time it's not a request. You you are the new Fox Six. You are now the platoon leader for the recon platoon of first of the fourteen. And he had my platoon sergeant standing out, hiding back behind his his hooch so I wouldn't see him, and brought in Staff Sergeant Harris, uh, who just filled the doorway of this GP small, and said, uh, Sergeant Harris, this is Lieutenant Headley. Uh, he's your new Fox Six. Uh, take care of him. Teach him what he needs to know. And so I walked out with Jimmy Harris. There is one thing that I, I don't know whether it needs clarification or not, but it occurs okay. to me that it might be it might be confusing to some listeners that it's Echo Company, but they're called Fox Force, which is yes. you would expect that to be Fox Company. So yes. I don't know I don't know whether that whether that needs to be clarified or not. But if you think okay. it does, you know okay. let's. Let's sure. clarify that. Because sure. you're so, Fox well, Six, but you're in Echo Company, it just seems like that yeah. would be confusing. I know that. Yeah, I know that's a little disturbing. Well, I can, I can swear that away. Okay. Um. So I, uh, Jimmy grabbed hold of me and, and took me down to my new CP on the bunker line. Uh, that was the recon CP when they were in and not out in the bush. And again, we went through the drill and meeting my squad leaders and all those things. Um, Fox Force is kind of a strange name, I suppose. Um, I, I, I've never heard of anything else that is similar. The story I heard behind that is Fox Force was assigned to Echo Company. Echo Company contained the Recon Platoon and the Florida Small Platoon. And those are the two components of Echo Company. Fox had originally been designed by a previous battalion commander to be another ad hoc maneuver unit, uh, company type, infantry company type unit. And, and so therefore it became Fox, it became F company, okay, or Fox company. Uh, when, when the company size thing didn't work out and the F designation stayed, uh, the guys at that point really liked being called Fox, I guess. And so Fox Force became the became a part of Echo Company um, as a battalion recon. Got it. Um, Thank you. Yeah. 
and they had a big reputation already by the time you they did they did um i i was still i mean even after i i received the uh the direct order to go be the platoon leader i was i still would like that pencil because they were involved in doing things that that, that i hadn't done um or and experiences that i'd never experienced and i thought again all right, I'm I'm a trained infantry lieutenant. I've I've been shot at. It's not like I, I'm 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 totally green behind ears anymore, and I can learn from these guys. So uh, Jimmy took me down, and this was a very very close unit, closer than any of the line platoons in the battalion because they got into hairier stuff and were more dependent upon each other to get back. And so Jimmy took me after the squad leaders. He took me around and introduced me to all the soldiers. I think I probably had maybe 25 guys. Okay? And the last guy he introduced me to um, was a guy by the name of Gary Nelson. And Gary Nelson was a quintessential peacenik Vietnam soldier. He had a mountain yard headband on. Uh, he had no shirt. He had all kinds of beads around his neck to include a big peace symbol. Um, his hair was long, hadn't shaved in a while, and he's cleaning his weapon. And Jimmy took up to him and said, hey, uh, Nelson, this is, uh, this is Lieutenant Headley, our new Fox 6. And he looked, Gary looked up at me and said, with a peace symbol, he said, hey, man. And I thought to myself, okay, I don't need him in this unit. We'll go see if we can put him somewhere else. Fortunately, I never did. He turned out to be one of the best soldiers and one of the bravest men that I have ever been around. He was one incredible soldier, but uh, just a different personality, right? So, uh, as, as you know, we talked about there were red scars, so I didn't get one. Uh, I had to go prove myself. I had to go prove myself worthy of wearing a red scarf, which meant I don't remember how many, two or three maybe. Um, exercises outside the wire, a couple of contacts with the bad guys. Um, and one day Jimmy came up and said, okay, six, you were in this. And he tied it around my neck. And that's where it stayed for the rest of the time I was with Fox. Um, a little bit about those guys. It's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. Okay, because they were phenomenal young men. Um, they weren't baby killers, druggies, rapists, or any of the other crap that we got labeled with when we came home. These were outstanding young men uh, that can hold their place above, right next to the revered soldier from the greatest generation of World War II. Right? Um, they, we did get into some really, really hairy situations. Um, as I got in with them, I learned that a lot of times we operated outside the range of radios, so we had no combo with them. We're on our own. A lot of times, many times, we're outside the range of direct support artillery. Um, so we had no big gun support on a lot of occasions. Uh, you know, people talk about the loads they carry, and probably the standard average load was 40 or 50 pounds for a grunt in Vietnam. Uh, one day, the brigade commander, whose name was Volunteer Warner, who became a three star at least, uh, noticed us as we were filing out of the wire to get on some birds to go out and do our thing. And he was a little concerned about the load that we were all carrying. So, and, and Colonel Warner and Colonel Robertson, every, almost every single time we came back in off an operation, were at the wire to meet us and greet us and welcome us back. Because we did sometimes some fairly exceptional stuff all the way around. Um, and they kind of took us under their arms and, and, and uh, uh, had a lot of respect for my guys. And so Colonel Warner directed that <clears throat> you guys are carrying too much. I want to weigh your rucksacks the next time you go out. No, we had scales there. They're going all the wire. We weighed the rucksacks. The average weight was north of 100 pounds. Okay. And I had little guys and big guys and skinny guys and muscular guys and whatever. And, and so he didn't interfere with the, I mean, we, we had a somewhat place to go. The birds were cranking. So we got on the birds and 
went off and did our thing. When I came back, he came down to the fire base and said, John, I want to talk to you. Yes, sir. I want to know how come you guys carry so much. I mean, that's got to just beat your soldiers to death. Why do you carry all that much? And I said, sir, basic, the basic story was, look, I'm a recon element. I'm out sometimes without combo with anybody or support from anybody. And I depend on stealth for my survival. I don't want to resupply helicopter in three days to tell the bad guys where I am. I don't want to do that. Uh, so my guys carry a double basic bomb because <clears throat> I want to be able to go at least five or six days without a resupply boat coming in. Uh, so we carry more meals. We carry probably a double basic load of ammunition. Um, we spread a lot of the stuff around, uh, radio batteries, M60 ammo, uh, that kind of stuff, bloop ammunition, whatever. Uh, and I said, and he said, but how, don't, don't your guys get tired? I mean, in this heat, you have heat problems? And I said, yes, sir, they get tired, but I've never had a heat problem because we don't move quickly. We move very slowly. And I keep an eye on these guys. So if we need to take a break, we do. I said, I, I will tell you um, that these guys are as silent in the woods as the uh, quintessential American Indian who could sneak through the woods and never make a sound, right? So my guys don't make noise. They move slowly and carefully. Um, and, and, and we need this for us to be able to do our job. Because if the bad guys find out where I am within three days, you know, I'm a very small unit, don't have a lot of firepower, maybe not a good thing. So he accepted that uh, <clears throat> rationale. Uh, the one thing I wanted to do was get rid of the steel pots and wear booty caps. And he wouldn't let me do that. He said, no, nah, you keep your steel pots on. You guys probably need them. Um, but I mean, I, 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 I can't say enough about these kids. Um, some were enlisted, had enlisted, a few were draftees. Um, there were a select bunch of soldiers. Uh, I never had a single problem with any of them. And God almighty, were they good. I mean, I put them up against any unit in Vietnam. We were never ambushed, ever. And we ambushed the bad guys lots of times, but we were never ambushed, which says a whole lot for the way this unit operated and the security and, and, and the, the attention to detail. Uh, with all the stuff we carried, we didn't jangle or rattle or anything. Uh, I got my rucksack checked out a couple of times in the first couple of operations by Jimmy Harris to make sure everything I had was, was tied down and wasn't going to make any noise. Uh, we were very careful about, we didn't carry hand grenades strapped to our web gear like a lot of guys did because going through wait a minute vines, something grabs that pin and pulls it off and all of a sudden you've got a catastrophic problem. So my guys carried hand grenades um, in ammo pouches because the ammo they kept in bandoliers. Uh, normally one tied around their waist and one connected in the middle to the middle of the bandolier and worn like a bra so you could get at it quickly as you needed to. Um, and most of us had two magazines taped together so we could do a real quick change if we had to, if we got into it. Um, and, and, and that's the way we, we operated. Um, my, I operated, as, I had, if I had 24 guys in the field, which is probably average for me, um, only 20 of them were real combat effective because two of them were my RTOs. I had each one of my squads had a PRIC 25 radio because sometimes we were apart from each other. And so each one of my squads had a PRIC 25. So I had an RTO, Al Buckaloo, uh, in my CP who was responsible for my internal frequency and keeping contact with my squads. That was his job. I had another RTO, Red Signer, who was responsible for maintaining combo with outside of our unit, with the TOC or whatever, the Red Legs or whoever we needed to get in contact. And I also had two medics uh, who traveled with my CP normally. Uh, one was a conscientious objector and never carried a weapon. Uh, the other guy carried a weapon, but I never saw him use it. Uh, and, and both these guys were superb, absolutely superb. 
So my normal effective strength, and you count me out of effective strength as I'm on the radio doing things or whatever, you know, we got 17, 18, 19 guys wandering around the jungles uh, all by themselves. Uh, a lot of times, not, I mean, swear to God, not able to talk to anybody. Um, and, and, and me realizing that if I got in trouble, it was on me. It was on me. I had nobody to call a lot of times. Um, so one of the lessons learned for me, particularly with Fox, was the heaviest responsibility you can give a man is to be responsible for other mother's sons. There is no responsibility heavier than that. Every one of those lives was my responsibility. And it's at the platoon level only where you have that kind of direct responsibility on contact. Once you get to be a company commander, you got platoon leaders and next one or whatever. But it, it, that platoon leader is the one directly responsible. And you know, when you hear the stories, I think I heard it on one of the things I listened to that when the bullets started kind of uprange, all the all the eyes turned to you. <clears throat> well, not so much with Fox, we had immediate reaction drills if we got into a contact. Guys automatically, squad leaders automatically know how to react and and, and what to do. Uh, but we were, and, and this is not patting myself on the back because it's not me, it's the guys. But we were very, very good at what we did. Uh, we were probably, the 1st Battalion, 14th Infantry was a, the only American unit in almost all of two corps, maneuver unit, permanently in two corps, which was a huge, huge geographical area. Every once in a while, one of the 101st or whatever would come in on an operation and, and, and operate an RAL. But most of the time, it was us. Um, we had a, we covered everything from, you know, almost to the coast up to the Cambodian border in the mountains, where we spent a good deal of our time trying to catch the little guys coming off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Um, I can't say enough for these guys. Uh, we just had a reunion uh, a couple of weeks ago in Nashville. We've been doing it since the year 2000. Um, since the year 2000, I'm very talented uh, to Agent Orange related issues. Uh, at this reunion, I had two or three who couldn't make it for medical, physical reasons. And I had one guy had to leave early for the same reason. Uh, one of the things I was asked, and, I, and this, is, this is a load that I carry personally, you know, the most precious resource in Vietnam for a soldier was water, right? I mean, without water, you don't live. And without water, you can go crazy. Uh, without water, you can't do your job or perform your mission. And so we carried a whole lot of water. When they came out with two corp uh, canteens, you know, it wasn't unusual for my guys to carry two or three of those plus a couple of one quart canteens on their belts. But it wasn't enough water to last us for five days until a resupply burn, if I would even accept one in five days. Um, we certainly knew about Agent Orange because we knew it killed vegetation. Uh, we had no idea what the, the other issues were concerning the Agent Orange. So we drank water from streams. We drank water out of, out of rice paddies. Um, we drank water out of rice paddies at the water buffalo we were using as stream. And we had the iodine tablets to put in them or you know that kind of stuff to kind of purify it. Um, Kool-Aid did a whole lot of business with us because we got all kinds of packets of Kool-Aid from them, try to kill the iodine taste. But we literally used water we could get in and streams, whatever. Um, and, and for a long time, I thought that maybe that's been the cause of a lot of my guys' issues because I'm sure we drank Agent Orange. Um, I mean, we lived in it, we slept in it, um, and, and, and we had no idea it was in the water, you know, we had no idea how lethal that stuff would, would be, and, we, and I thought we were doing good living off the land, it helped us maintain our security. Um, so that's one of the downsides of what I was doing. Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I know that it, I mean, it permeated everything in the environment. Yeah. So yeah, even, sure if you hadn't, even if you hadn't been drinking the water, 
you know, yeah. there, there are two dozen other ways that you could have been exposed. Sure. I mean, going through the underbrush and triple canopy jungle, you know, it, it had worked its way down. It was all over the place. I mean, yeah, you're right. But, you know, that may have been a, I mean, to lose 10 guys out of a total of maybe 30 who cycled through the platoon while I was there, uh, well, that's a heavy load. Well, John, I want to get to uh, to your homecoming and your post-Vietnam experience. But before we do that, um, you mentioned that that Fox Force got involved in some pretty extraordinary – you said we did some pretty extraordinary things. Yeah. Um, are there any of those things that you feel comfortable sharing before we move on, just so that people have some idea of what we're talking about? Um, I, 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 can, I can briefly handle a couple of – I don't have to get into details. Yeah, it's it's up to you, uh, John. It's your call. Yeah. I'm just. Uh... Um, I mean, we we had a lot of contact with the bad guys. Like I said, we never were ambushed, but we caught them a lot of times, and and we had a lot of small, if you can call a firefight small. We had a lot of small firefights against three, four, or five bad guys, uh, and we normally were successful in eliminating all of them. Um, I never got hung up on body count. You know, that was a measure of success for a platoon leader was body count. I, I, I never called in the body count. That, that was a horrible way to, to, to quantify success in that environment, and I refused to do it. Um, but we had a couple of really major times that stick in my memory and will forever. Um, if, have you read the book? Do you know? Okay. Um, there was one night when Firebase St. George was uh, almost overrun by sappers and NBA regulars. Um, they took out, I mean, I was a humorous side of that story before I get into the bad stuff, but uh, we had just come in from a mission. They had been kind of hairy. Um, and as I was wont to do when we were on St. George, I'd spend some time with my guys cleaning weapons and drinking. There were a couple, always a couple of bottles of Jack Daniels around or something, a warm beer or whatever, and drinking and, and just telling stories. And then I would leave them at night by themselves without my presence. And I'd go up and sleep in a BOQ tent that we had in the admin area of the fire base. I didn't do that with Charlie Company. I stayed, I slept in my CP bunker. But this time I got to think, you know, these guys really need to detox from some of the shit that we've been through. Maybe they want to talk about me. Maybe they want to criticize me. But, you know, I don't need to be there. And if something comes out, they'll tell me. So I go up to the uh, um, EOQ tent. And this one particular night, uh, I was pretty well <clears throat> under the weather from drinking boiler makers. Um, and uh, the only night in Vietnam that I took off my boots, I had no idea why I did that that night. But I took my boots off, and we had cots in the BOQ tent and pallet floors instead of mud. You know, so it was, it, it was like going to a Holiday Inn, you know, compared to living in a bunker. And and I, I and I had the first cot on the left going through the front, and I, I we had flak jackets which we never wore except on the fire base when the VIPs were coming in and they wanted to see all the soldiers in their flak jackets. Otherwise, they were worthless. But I used one for a pillow normally. Um, and I, I took off my shirt and I took off my boots. Fortunately, I didn't take off my pants. That turned out to be a good thing for me that night. And I laid down in my foggy stupor and went to sleep. Um, at midnight, our alert siren went off. You know, the, the siren was like, would you have a volunteer fire department? Almost exactly the same thing goes off to get all the firemen in, right? It was the same type of siren, wailing and wailing. I'm thinking, oh my God, what the heck is going on? And I look up and I see stars. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And then I thought, why the hell am I seeing stars? Well, this tent had been shredded by some incoming. Unfortunately, it hadn't shredded me in the process. And then all of a sudden, the senses kicked in and I heard, an incredible cacophony of noise. Uh, you can tell in a minute that there's an M16 and AK-47. Um, and an art, and the, 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 the light machine guns the NBA carried 
and our and our pigs are in sixties, right? And and I'm hearing all this, and it's obvious to me that oh my God, this is not good. So I rolled off my bed, and I said, I can't go out and fight without my boots. I gotta have my boots. Like I, I couldn't find them. It's like the longest day, where the German officer rolls out of bed, and he puts the long boot on the wrong foot. If you remember that, fortunately I got him on the right foot. Uh, but but I was. I don't like to use the word panicking, but that's probably pretty close. I mean, I needed to get my boots on. Um, and, and my normal way was, I always carried a knife in my left boot, uh, a fighting knife in my left boot. Uh, and, and, and I stuck that in. Uh, I grabbed a couple of bandoliers of ammo. I carried a car 15, um, grabbed that magazine, went and grabbed my steel pot and I headed out the door. And the tent shredded. And I can, Send you pictures to show you. What it is. And I, there's tracers going red and green going across the firebase. And there's explosions from rockets and mortar rounds going off and whatever. And I had maybe not 100 yards, maybe an 80 yard, 70 or 80 yard run from where I was to get down to my CP room, my soldiers were. And I started off down there, um, a mortar went off right next to me, blew me off my feet. Fortunately, didn't put any big holes in me. Um, I got back up, found my steel pot, my weapon, and I made it down. And my, my RTO was fucking red. We had a sandblast wall opposite the entrance of the bunker, and they're on either side of that wall, covering my butt as I'm running down to the CP. And I made it inside. And, and again, you know, you, you, you get in combat and you're your body goes crazy. I mean, you can hear your heart. Like I said, it's in your ears. And I mean, it's just, you're, it's, it's entirely unique feeling. And I had some firing slits in the front of my bunker. Uh, and we had sort of a half assed trench that went up to the next one with a couple of firing slits. I had three bunkers for that. And and I, in this bunker, I can hear the boom, boom, boom of, of mortars going off. Not ours, right? And they were coming in, and and uh, Red Signer looked out and said, "I think I see where they're coming from." I said, "Okay, get on the horn and call the company mortar platoon and give them the data to, for counterfire." Well, couldn't raise anybody in the right on the fire base, um, and I decided at that point with the explosions and so forth that my guys is instinct you get inside where you feel you're safe, and that's the last place you want to be. When you got sappers running around throwing satchel charges into your, into your bunker, right? So I got most of the guys out. I said, man, the positions, but everybody else get your asses out of these CD bunkers and get a good fire position. And I want 360 degree security of RAO. I don't care how go do that. Jimmy Harris went around and got that. And I walked out of that bunker trying to figure out what was going on. And out of the bunker, I looked down to my left and past my first bunker was the company street uh, that the vehicles used to come in and our helipad was out there. And then the first three bunkers had been my Apache bunkers. <clears throat> All I could see was flames um, coming from my, my old bunkers. I, I saw no outgoing fire from that area. Uh, the company CP and the mortars were right behind them, and there was nothing coming from there. Um, so I figured I was the only officer left alive on that side of the bunker line. So I went down to check that area out to see what was going on. Um, anyway, there was a huge hole there. There were half a dozen bunkers that were empty, except for guys left inside. I'm, I'm told years later, Years later, I'm told that I crawled into the first bunker, because I know I crawled over there, because there was, I don't know what's going on, but I crawled into the first bunker and there was a soldier that was trapped under one of the beams that held the ceiling up that had come down with the explosion. He tells me I dragged him out of there and saved his life. I don't remember that. I have zero memory of that, as hard as I think. But I checked out the area and there was nobody there. And, I, and it was obvious that that was an area that the sappers had come through. Um, so I got my guys and said, 
I went, I made it back to my Fox CP and I got some of my guys and said, all right, guys, we're going to go plug this hole. <clears throat> I don't know what's there. I don't know who's there. Um, you know, this is going to be a very dicey situation, but I need you to plug this hole. Uh, so I um, grabbed, I think, probably a squad's worth. Um, I put a, a gun team up on top of uh, the first bunker on the unruined part of the roof uh, to take care of guys coming through the water. Anyway, we made it through the night, and, and, and I, I, um, I credit my guys for saving, for saving that fire base. Uh, we found out afterwards that there were, as normally happens, the sappers come in one way, and there's an NVA company plus or battalion almost opposite waiting for word from the sappers that the guns on had been neutralized in the artillery battery. And then they, because they were scared death was a beehive rounds and they'd come in the other way, right? And then that's all she wrote. And there were maybe 90 of us on that fire base that night, maybe. Um, so the sun came up, we still held the fire base and, and, and it was my guys. I had some casualties that night, but, but my guys never a question, never a hesitation. Um, at one point, I'm in one of the gun pits trying to plug a hole from in there. Where should I have come over somebody? And who hops in with me but Al Buckham with his radio? I said, Buck, what in the hell are you doing here? He said, you don't have a radio, Six. And so because of Buck, I was able to get hold of our Florida's mortal platoon. And I started calling and fires on the as of approach into or egress from our fire base and just smash the heck out of everything. But that was fun. Um, so that was one occasion where my guys just shown. Um, no panic. Three or four days after that, uh, we get a call from the division commander. The battalion talk gets a call from the division commander. I want Fox Force to go do this. And evidently some intel had picked up what might have been the retreating NBA leaving the air because we got they hit us the second night as well not through the wire but indirect fire direct fire whatever and a little bit on the third night uh, and then they took off <clears throat> and so i did basically a dusk combat assault um no time to do a vr a, a, a reconnaissance I picked out a spot on the map uh, and so again there's nothing worse than nighttime in Vietnam because we weren't equipped to deal with that and we didn't know the terrain. And I'm sure other people have told you, you know, the night belongs to Charlie, not to us. Um, and so we, fortunately the LZ was cold. We unasked the birds, moved into a tree line and we hunkered down. And I had found, I'd had a chance to talk with my squad leader. On the map I showed on a small hill next to the CP, next to the LZ, maybe 150 meters away or so that we could easily traverse in the dark, and that we were going to go to the top of this hill and set up. Um, so we hunker down for a while, make sure no noise, nobody heard us, saw us, whatever. And we very quietly and stealthily walked up, moved up to the top of this hill, just as the sun was setting. Um, I managed to get, I, like I said, I hadn't had replacements yet for my casualties. Um, so we were under strength, uh, but we set up a perimeter up there, uh, and we had no combo. We had no combo with the battalion. We had no combo with the red legs. Charlie Signers on the fort frantically trying to get support because we got nobody out there. Uh, I had been told that the artillery was going to do a hip shoot for me the next day where they'd move a couple of tubes, one or two tubes forward on their own to a place where they'd get me within their range so they could provide me some support if I needed it. Um, but I went ahead and you know did my thing with the map and registrations and whatever. Um, it was very quiet and I put out LPs and we hunkered down for the night. And we were going to go follow the bad guys the next day and see what was up. Well, during that night, I, I don't know what time, I, I got a call on one of the radios from one of my LPs that he heard movement out there. Um, asked him what it was. He said he couldn't tell, but there was noise. And then I got it from another. Um, who said he heard what sounded like rifle slings dragging on the ground. Um, then I got it from another 
who said he thought he could hear metal clicking. Okay, the bad guys are out there, right? And so my thought process, I always, if I'll also try to put myself in the mind of the guy that I was facing off with, to a certain degree. And I thought, okay, this guy knows where I am and he knows what I have and he's still coming for me, which tells me he probably has more than I do. You know, he's got more marbles in his pocket than I do. Um, real, uh, that was one of the scariest nights I ever had. Because there I am on this hilltop with nowhere to go, and bad guys coming to get me. Um, and no radio combo. I couldn't get any help. Um, and I got these other mother sons who were depending on me to get them home. Um, and I finally figured a couple of courses of action. Uh, we weren't going to just sit there and die. Uh, there were a couple of courses of action where I didn't want to throw hand grenades down the hill because they bounce off the trees and bounce back at you sometimes. But we could maybe roll hand grenades down the hill. We could do a mad minute and everybody open up and see if we could scare them off with that. Um, we could charge into it, you know, like in the old days, fix bayonets and go. Except I didn't have bayonets, so I couldn't do that. Um, but I did find another little hill doing a map with my red lens on my on my flashlight underneath the poncho, another little hill. I got hold of Jimmy Harris, who was Ranger qualified, and said, okay, Jimmy, uh, we're going to E&E &E off this hill because we're in deep shit. Um, and when I give the word, I want you, um, first off, I want you go around and brief the squad leaders if we have time on where we're going and what we're doing. And you lead the guys to the other hilltop and I'll cover you and get them out of here. And kind of strange that one side of my perimeter had no movement, which told me maybe the bad guys were waiting for me to do what I was, I thought I was going to do. But you got to take that chance. You got to roll the dice and see what comes up. It's the only recourse I had other than stand in place and die in place, basically. Um, and then all of a sudden, Charlie Siner comes over as a six, six. I got Puff. Puff the Magic Dragon, C-47 gunship, AC-47 gunship. And there's a Puff bird all of a sudden coming in. I don't remember his call sign, but he knew mine. He called down, oh, Fox, this, this, the brother, understand you're in trouble. Well, how the hell did you find out? And Evan, what happened was while we couldn't receive communications, Division Rear was monitoring our communications and picking up what we were sending out looking for help, maybe mm -hmm. bouncing off the clouds or something. Who knows? The Prince 25 was a rear radio. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, Puff comes over and I'm thinking, okay, what are we going to do with this? And he said, Do you have a strobe light? And I said, Well, yeah, I always carried one on my own. On my harness, I never used it. I didn't know even know if they had a friggin' battery in it. I said, "Yeah, I got one." He says, "Okay, what I want you to do is to uh, take off your steel pot and put it on your lap. Have all your guys pull back and put their boots in your lap, and turn on that strobe light. And everything 15 feet out from that is mine." What? I mean, have you seen movies of what an AC-47 looks like when it fires? Yeah. I have. Yeah. Is that the, sorry, may, let me make sure that I'm getting the right. Was that the one, uh, Angel of Death? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 I have yeah, seen that. Yeah. Had a couple yeah. of miniguns on the side. And, That's fearsome. Yeah. Oh, it is. And I said, he said, I'm, I'm going to surround you with fire. Oh, my God. And he said, tell your guys to put their hands over their ears and open their mouths to try to equalize the pressure because you are, have never experienced what you're about to experience. Okay. Now, what has got to, there was no panic in my guys. Absolutely no panic. And I whispered out to them what was going on. You know, I mean, we had some whispered combo during this whole thing. I never had one guy show any amount of fear. They were ready to do anything I told them to do. There was absolutely no panic. They were all locked and loaded. And if we were going down, there was a whole bunch of those other guys who were going to go down with us. You know, they would, they would, they would, they would, they would die fighting. Um, incredible young men. I mean, on this mountaintop all by ourselves. Right? And so, you know, we did what we were told and sure as that puff lit up the night. I've never had an experience like that before. 
Um, all the spent casings, shell casings came down on us. All the hot shell casings came down on us. Um, and there was this absolute cone of red all the way around us. We heard secondary explosions. It was so noisy, we couldn't hear screams if anybody got hit, but we could hear the secondary explosions, maybe grenades going off. Um, and my guys were there. Um, he got finished expending. He saw a whole bunch of flashlights coming down on opposite ridge line. We never used flashlights at night, so those were the bad guys. And and I I, I said that once he got once he did us, he said, "What else can I do for you?" And I said, "Can you come back and check on me in a couple hours, please, to make sure we're still here?" And he said, "I'll be here all night. Don't worry about it." But I got all these flashlights over here. I got to check out. So he flew over there and puffed, breathed fire again, and all the flashlights went out. Um, and he and he did. He circled around all night long until the sun came up. And called down and said, "How are you doing?" And I said, "Thanks to you, we're doing fine. Everybody's, every every everybody is alive and well. Thanks to you guys." Uh, and, and that was an ex, an incredible experience, during which a lot of guys would fall apart. You know, you're going to die. Mm. You're going to die. Mm -hmm. um, this is a last resort. Not my guys. Not my guys. Mm. So. So when did you, uh, did you just do the one tour, John, or did you yes. go back? Yeah. So I, I did, did one tour. Uh, I came back and was assigned to the old guard in DC uh, as a company, got to be a company commander, which I absolutely loved, but I wanted to go back to the war. I was a, I was a warrior, you know, I was trained to fight a war, not to be pretty in a parade. Um, and, and I couldn't get out because I had a White House clearance and all that kind of stuff that cost a lot of money. So they weren't going to let me go back to Vietnam. So I wrangled orders to flight school out of a buddy of mine in, in Milperson, and he jury rigged some orders for me to get me into flight school, but I would have gone to flight Cobras or something. Uh, and the orders came down to, to my desk, not to the battalion. And I took them over and gave them to the S1 and said, hey, Bob, look at this, man. I got orders. Sorry, but I got to get out of here and go to flight school. He said, hang on a minute. He took him into the commander who was an 06. He called me in. And we've been on pretty good terms. And he said, Henley, what in the F do you think you're getting away with? And I said, what do you mean, sir? He said, where in the hell did these orders come from? And I said, sir, I don't know. I mean, they just showed up on my on my desk. They came out of mill percent. I don't know how they got there. He said, did you wrangle something here? And I said, sir, when I do something like that, uh, I love my job. And he looked up at me. And he took those orders and he ripped them up into many pieces, threw them in the trash can, and said, "Get the f out of my office." Yes, sir. And 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 so I did a smart about face and exited as quickly as I could, um, and and spent the rest of that tour with the old guard. And he and I were on great terms. He chewed my butt a little bit for trying to get away with something, but mm -hmm. uh, that was that was a great assignment. Um, it was oh, the hardest. Just... Sorry, go ahead. I say it's a hard assignment because every month I buried officers in Arlington, uh, most of whom were Vietnam returnees. That was a tough thing to do because <clears throat> we weren't allowed to show emotions. Um, we had to be stoic. Uh, but I looked every one of those widows or mothers in the eye um, and gave them the, you know, the little comforting words that we did and presented the flag. Um, I buried one of my lieutenants from the old guard who went to Vietnam and I'd taken him down to then Camp AP Hill, now Fort AP Hill, and spent time with him in the woods on weekends, teaching him everything I knew, I thought. And he came back in about three months and we buried him. Um, but I was honored to do that. You know, it was the last view of the United States Army that most of these families would ever have. And I wanted it to be top-notch. My soldiers drilled, they practiced, they were, again, another incredible bunch of soldiers. Um, and, and while that got to be hard at times, it was, there was still some pride involved at the end of the day, knowing that we had sent one of our own off in the best way that we possibly could. Uh, how, how long did you stay in the Army? 24 years. Did you run into any of your uh, 
West Point classmates at any point in your career? Oh yeah, periodically along the way somewhere I'd run into one or two of them. Yeah. Yeah. Not in Vietnam, I'm guessing. No. Uh, uh, well, I did. I, I did run into a couple of them in Vietnam, but one of my roommates was in the Cav Squadron in the division. And I was back in the rear at one point after we moved to Anke and he came over, he'd heard I was there. And he came over to say hey and and, uh, and uh, chew the fat a little bit with me. Uh, ran into another one uh, in the unit adjacent to us on Anke. Uh, so I, I went to the hospital once to see one of my classmates who I had heard been wounded and I went to the hospital to check up on him. Uh, but uh, I mean, the fourth ID was not, you know, was not a glamorous unit. It wasn't like going to the 82nd or the 101st or the first cab or one of the ranger companies or whatever. Um, even though they had, you know, assaulted a beach on D-Day, um, it, it, it was not a, a glamorous unit. So there, there weren't a whole lot of guys who tried to get there. Um, incredible soldiers, fine soldiers. Well, do you want to shift gears now? Talk a little bit about uh, just what you've been doing lately uh, sure. with veterans. Sure. So what? When? So you? Let's see. You went in. I'm going to try to do the math here. You went in '68. Uh, you were yeah. commissioned in '68. You stayed yes. in for 24 years. Yes. So no, that's 90, 92, basically. Actually, actually, it was the beginning of '91, I think, because I got credit for that three years enlistment. Got it. For okay. Purposes, purposes. Because I had had I been booted out of West Point because of my physical issues, I would have wound up in the United States Army as an E five going to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So I I was still fulfill fulfilling my enlistment. So I got credit for that time. I see. So about ninety one, then you uh, yeah. you retired. Early ninety one. Yeah. And uh, did you retire in? the charlotte area or did you have you moved since you retired um no when i retired it was in the boston when i retired from the army it was in the the boston area i mean i retired in louisiana retirement mm -hmm. ceremony but I, I took a job with raytheon when i retired and raytheon headquartered in boston so that's where we went um i had been trained as a japan fail you know what that is Foreign area officer, specialist in Japan, language and culture. The army trained people in various geographical areas. Okay. Uh, and uh, so Raytheon hired me because I had been to Japan and I knew the language and I knew the culture and they had a lot of programs going in Japan. Um, so they hired me to go <clears throat> be the liaison with a Japanese customer and so forth for a couple of years. I came back to an assignment in the Boston area. An opening came up in Tokyo at a little bit higher level than I'd been serving in before. Uh, so I went back to do that. And we wound up spending eight years in Japan on that assignment. So a total of 13. Um, and when I came back to the States from Raytheon, uh, oh, when 9-11 happened in the States, um, and everything went to hell here for a while, real estate market and everything else. And Margie and I came back on a home lease shortly thereafter. Uh, actually, Margie came back with our daughter and I came back later, but in an almost empty airplane, the Japanese didn't fly because they were afraid of being run into a building or something. Um, we decided we might want to buy a place for eventual retirement. Um, not necessarily to move into then because I was still working, but we bought this house and we rented it back to the people that we bought it from for a couple of years. Um, and so I went back to Japan. Uh, my daughter was entered her senior year at Penn State. I decided that I needed to be home for her for that because that's a <clears throat> that's a pretty pivotal year trying to decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Uh, and I figured I needed to be here to help her through that. She wanted to be a forest stranger after all the money I put into Penn State. I thought she needed a little bit of help. Uh, so we moved here. I continued to work for a couple of years. Um, and, I, and I was doing supply chain stuff. 
uh, for the Japan programs and going around and meeting all our vendors in the States. And I had a couple of experiences that weren't too pleasant with vendors who didn't really care too much about the quality of what they were turning out. And one day I was out in LA and I walked over to a motel room and said, what the hell am I doing still working? I don't need to do this. So I came home and called Raytheon and said, you got any packages on the horizon? Uh, and they did, so I opted to retire Retire at that point. Here in, in, uh, North, in, in uh, Denver, North Carolina. But I wasn't ready to quit. I needed something to do. And, and so I started networking, trying to find another job, uh, something around here that I could do. Um, I met a guy who had been a Marine who put me on to a, he said, what do you miss most about being out of the Army? I said, people, shared sense of mission, uh, being able to count on them, being able to believe them. Uh, you don't find that necessarily in the civilian world. Uh, and he said, well, go up and check out this place up in Mooresville called Pat's Cornet Coffee Shop. Um, it's run by a Charlie, former Charlie model gunship pilot with his wife. Um, and they just sell coffee to people. But he has a soft spot in his heart for Vietnam vets. And what's the name of the town that Pat's? That's Mooresville, Mooresville, North Carolina. Mooresville. Mooresville. It's home of NASCAR. Um, it's probably about 20 miles from where I am now. Uh, so I, I did. I went in and met Richard, uh, Richard Warren, who was running it. Um, he welcomed me home. Uh, got to be good friends with him. I decided I want to do my own thing. So I set up my own company, do consulting for people wanting to do work in Japan. Um, and, and this is another one of those stories I'm about to tell you. Um, phenomenal stories. Um, and, and shortly thereafter, I had a, a, re a reunion of my recon platoon here at the house. I have almost an acre on the lake. Um, it's a beautiful piece of property. There's motels around. It's, it's a great place to get a bunch of people. I got a swimming pool in the backyard. I live like I never thought I would ever live. Um, so I had a reunion. So I asked Richard, I said, look, um, can I bring my guys up before you open on a Saturday morning so that you can welcome them home? I had a girl Friday named Cheryl Ann who worked with them. And she made little key rings and with, with beads on a leather thong of representing the U.S. flag or Vietnamese flag or, you know, green for army and scarlet for Marines and, and that kind of thing that she gave to everybody. And he said, sure. And so, again, red scarves, we went over together. So we all had our red scarves on, and we trooped on up to Mooresville. Only the guys. I didn't take the wives and kids with me. And we walked in, and God bless Richard Ward. He had two tape decks going. And these days, I have to explain to people what a tape deck is. Um, but he had two tape decks going. One was the wop, 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 if you were the helicopter blades that makes any grunt's heart just beat. And the other was Vietnam era music. And he went around and thanked every one of my guys for their service and their service in Vietnam. Cheryl Ann went around and gave every one of them a hug and a kiss and gave them this keychain and let them know how important they were. And Michael, I looked around and I had all these hardcore, hard bitten combat infantrymen with tears in her eyes. Jimmy Harris is standing there with tears pouring down his cheeks. Okay. Uh, they'd never been welcomed home. They'd never had this kind of a reception. So uh, we stayed about an hour and I brought him back to the house. I went up a couple of weeks later to thank Richard for what he had done. And I walked into Pat's Gourmet Coffee Shop and Richard just a little guy, but he grabbed me and said, John, I got to talk to you. And he started dragging me out of the shop onto the sidewalk. And I thought, holy cracks, my guy stole something or, or broke something. You know, I'm in trouble. What's your first thought? <laughs> that was my first thought. <laughs> These are a rough bunch of guys still. And uh, uh, so I, he got me out on, on his corner and he started asking me questions. Were you in such and such a place in December of 1969? Yes. Were you in such and such a situation? Yes. That was the time I almost became the George Armstrong Custer in the Vietnam War. Um, he said, were you in deep shit? And I said, yes. Were you having combo problems? Yes. 
did you have a fac overhead? And he said, do you remember who your first air support was that day? And what he's talking about is I, I've got 14 or 15 guys in a circle to include me and my RTOs. Uh, we had stumbled into an NBA battalion in the bunker complex that was coming for us. And I was looking at an NBA company forming up in the wood line, bugles blowing, whistles blowing, whatever, and they were going to come get me because they knew that I was a pretty small little unit. And these two Charlie model gunships rolled in on this wood line um, and expended. And when they circled around for their second pass, I didn't see an NBA company formed up in the wood line anymore. And, he, and, and, and Richard that day outside, he said, do you remember who your first air support was? And I'm sorry, Richard, I know. And I said, I had, I had a handset in one ear and, and, and my trigger going on the other hand. No, I, I don't remember who it was. He said, it was me. It was me and my, my wingman. And my knees almost gave out. I mean, here's a guy who saved our lives. Right? And I said, how in the hell do you know that? He said, because we circled around to come in for another run, my crew chief gets on the horn and says, who are those crazy MFers down there wearing red scarves? So years later in Mooresville, North Carolina, I run into a guy who probably saved the lives of my soldiers and me on that day in December of 1969. And all of you guys were reuniting in his cafe. Yes. Without any, I mean, obviously without knowing. Without having any idea of who he was, other than being Richard Ward, and we knew he'd been a gunship pilot. So let me ask you this. How, I mean, you guys all walked in there wearing red scarves. Yeah. But it was it was sometime later that he put the pieces together. It, it, was, a, it was a week or two later when I went up to thank him. Because he was busy going around welcoming all the guys. You know, and maybe the red scarves hadn't hit right away or something. I, I, I don't know mm. why he didn't mm -hmm. ask mm -hmm. that question that day. Um, but there's no ind any indication that he was familiar with us at all. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I, my knees about buckled. I, I, I broke down because here's a guy who saved our lives. Now all of a sudden I was meeting about 35 years, 40 years later. Mm. Um, and, and there was no doubt about the fact that he was there and because all the details matched of my situation and, and, and what he did in our red scarves. Um, when I told my guys about it, it was the same reaction for all of them. They met a guy who was responsible for them being around and having kids and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Richard, unfortunately, was eaten up by Agent Orange. Uh, within a year of this time, he passed away. Um, well, at, before that, yeah, he passed away. Excuse me, when he passed away, his then ex-wife came up from Florida and evidently had some words with the landlord that he didn't like. And the landlord shut down Pat's Gourmet Coffee Shop and kicked us all out of there. Um, before he passed, Richard wanted to form a 501c3 uh, named Welcome Home Veterans, because that's what he was all about. He spent holidays going around researching veterans' graves in Mooresville and getting people to go put flags on them. At Christmas time, he went around, before Reese Across America, and he went around and had people put wreaths on veterans' graves, Confederate or or uh, you know, modern it made no difference. Of course, we're in North Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. um, he emptied his pockets for veterans in need financially. I mean, the guy was a was a saint, and that was his thing was to take care of vets. Mm -hmm. uh, so we managed to form a five hundred one c three and get it approved, um, named Welcome Home Veterans, um, and we were able to tell him that shortly before he passed. Um, when he passed, I was invalided as well. Um, but when we covered, uh, we found we there, were, there was a crew of us who wanted to keep Richard's spirit alive and keep this welcome home veterans alive as an entity. We found a restaurant down near the interstate that allowed us go in on Saturday mornings before they opened and just get together and talk. Um, 
with that small group, uh, we formed a board of directors. Uh, I was asked to join, which I gratefully did. Uh, we had a couple of meetings and this one, uh, I came into the next meeting and was, hello, Mr. President, we're glad you're here. Because the guy who had been president of the board left to go off and do other things. And because, you know, it's always easy to throw the absent guy under the bus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I became the president of the board of directors. Uh, my change of command ceremony was being handled literally a, a paper bag, a grocery bag, in which there were some receipts, some checks and a check register, which showed that I had somewhere a little north of $2,000 to my name for welcome home events. Mm -hmm. And we progressed. I mean, we found a place, a small place to rent. We rented that and got active again and started getting donations and whatever. We found a bigger place. Um, where we are now, um, it's in the heart and soul of Richard Warren. Across the street was Pat's Gourmet Coffee Shop. Out our back doors is where he passed. I'm sorry, the out, out your back door is what? Out the back door was the site where his house had been, in which he had passed, and which the town had torn down as a hazmat site. Um, everybody, they, they ringed it with barricades, and everyone who went in had a hazmat suit on and a mask and whatever, as they took it down. Um, so I've been involved with that. I've been the president and or executive director for 14 years. Uh, we have built it up to an, an absolutely in, in, in incredible place. Check us out on welcomevets.com. Um, we take care of all kinds of needy vets. We're all volunteers. Uh, the place is now paid off. Uh, a long process to do that. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's an incredible gathering place for veterans. And we have Richard started this tradition of free coffee for vets on Thursday. And we still do free coffee for vets on Thursday. Offer a vet something free and he comes, right? And we put more than 100 people in that place on, on Thursdays. And we have folks in during the week. Uh, Saturdays, another Richard tradition was live music, where veterans and townspeople come in and pick and grin for a couple hours on Saturday morning. And we still do that. Um, so my... Um, I can never, I can never pay Richard back for what he did for my guys and probably me that day in December of 1969. So I'm doing everything I can to pay forward. I'm trying to keep the spirit alive. I know how involved he was with taking care of veterans and that's become my life. Um, that's what I've done for 14 years. Uh, We've done some phenomenal things for needy guys. I've had, um, excuse me, I've had three guys come up and tell me if it hadn't been for, it's now Richard's Coffee Shop. It's not anymore Pat's Gourmet Coffee Shop. It's Richard's Coffee Shop. And I've had vets come up and tell me had it not been for Richard, they would have been one of the 22 a day. Um, they were that close to taking their own lives. Um, We've done a phenomenal job of Vietnam vets who come in fighting post-traumatic stress, uh, feeling like they're bad guys, that their story is unique, they're horrible, they don't deserve to be alive. And yet they can sit down with any number of us who have been in the same place, done the same things, and, 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 and bolster their psychological uh, strength and let them know that they're not bad. They're not evil, no matter what people say. You know, They did what they were told to do. Uh, it's become a destination place for snowbirds coming from the Northeast heading to Florida or going back again uh, because we've been come, we've become known on social media. And, and that's, uh, like I said, that place has become my life. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's almost like a ministry, you know, taking care of, taking care of vets. Yeah. Well, I can tell it means a lot to you. It I, does. uh, you know, I go visit my mother in Colombia uh, a oh, few times, a few times a year, and and uh, it, it, there are very few places in America that you can fly direct to Colombia, South Carolina. You're always going through Atlanta or Charlotte, or I like sure. to actually fly into Charleston and rent a car and drive up from Charleston. But yeah. uh, yeah. you know, 
about about a third of those visits i end up flying into charlotte and renting a car and yeah. driving down mm -hmm. um so the next time i do that i will come to richard's coffee shop yeah you, you know i'll tell you what if, if you come to town i mean it's, it's going to be it's going to require an ron i'm sure uh we remain overnight we have separate living quarters on our walkout basement uh we'll put you up you don't have to worry about motel, hotel or whatever oh um, and i and i would be happy to take you to richard's coffee shop i think i think it would blow you away uh, i yeah, have people just... walk in there and the first expression i hear from people particularly guys sometimes when they walk in is holy shit when you look at this um it's a, it's a phenomenal place yeah yeah i'd love to see it i'd love to talk to some of those guys oh and you <laughs> you could spend hours in there talking with these guys yeah yeah good well john you've been super generous with your time i mean we've been on for uh gosh two and a half hours uh um, yeah wow. it, is there is there anything i didn't ask you that you thought i would or you wish i had um the only thing that you haven't asked me is about my second book. Um, and the only reason I mentioned that, I'm not trying to hawk it uh, or sell it, but you know, I'm into legacy these days. I yeah. wrote that first book, that first book as a legacy document for my guys. So no one would ever have to ask, what did you do in the war game? Um, the second book from the shadows is a legacy book for my 20 classmates whose names are on that wall behind. Um, and I, uh, we, we had a memorial, a class memorial weekend last year in June. The whole thing was centered on memorializing these 20 guys. I had my book available for that, published, available. Uh, we had a, an incredibly emotional ceremony at the wall. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a prelude that, that explains Vietnam for people who may not know. I mean, that's 50 years ago. There are people, there's a center, there's a section that explains our West Point, because the current West Point in no way ever resembles what our West Point was like. Is that right? And then, oh yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know your politics, so I won't get into the details, but it's it's nothing like it's, it's very civilianized, it's eaten up with all this other crap that you find in civilian colleges, because the American military is that way now. It's very mm. woke, yeah. when I swear. Sure. Um, but and and then there's the story of each one of those twenty guys um, that I tried to get from from birth to death. Uh, I've been told that it's a superb book. Um, uh, if you want to look at it, I gave Jim Knotts a copy of it. Um, and and uh, and again, that's a legacy document. I wrote it. You know, we're all getting, I turned 78 last Sunday. Um, we're all getting kind of long in the tooth in the class of 1968. Mm -hmm. And when we all go away, although a very, very honorable place to be, I didn't want those 29 names, those 20 names to disappear into the wall. Mm -hmm. I don't know of a more honorable place it could be, but I didn't want them to disappear. I wanted their stories told so that they would be individuals that somebody could read about. I wish to help people could do that for the other 54,000 plus names on that wall. Yeah. Um, but that was a, an incredible undertaking. I wouldn't have just given me survivor guilt because these guys are gone, to include a roommate of mine. Um, and I'm still here. How come? Why? Um, but that's, that's probably one of my, my proudest accomplishments because I loved our West Point. I love my class. Uh, we went through hell together, individually, but together as a class in Vietnam. Um, it's a phenomenal group of men. There are no women, of course, in those days. Uh, and, and at times I don't feel like I deserve to be a member of that class, but I'm so proud that I am, that I can stand in ranks with these guys, you know? Uh, and, and that book is probably one of my proudest accomplishments. It's not a bestseller by any means because it's, it's not a subject that attracts a whole lot of people necessarily. Uh, but boy, I'll tell you what, the response I got from my class watered my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, 
So uh, that's that's the only other thing that that I've I've accomplished since Vietnam related that I wanted to mention. Interesting statistic. Last thing I'll share with you because I know you probably want to go, but that I, I did some research with writing that last book. According to a couple of different government sources, uh, 2.5 million Americans set boots on the ground in Vietnam during the course of that war. Two sources. One said there's about 800,000 of us left. Another one says, yeah, it's more like 600,000 of us left. One third to one fourth of those guys are all that are left at this point because Agent Orange and age has taken so many. 